now I remember to turn off this turn on this thing, this thing. well <coughs> you get my point here uh, search graphs can tell you quite a lot actually and uh, the shape of them can be can be discussed um, The Asia Pacific and Middle East markets has, has driven this uh, this uh, growth in in air freight. Uh, <coughs> we see the historic development that, uh, between Middle East and Europe it goes quite a lot of uh, of uh, fruit, which is transported uh, among other things, um <coughs> and then we have the Europe Asia, South Asia Europe markets with uh, with components uh, sub assemblies and uh, and things like that this is uh, this is a forecast <coughs> we see that uh, this is a region where growth is expected to, to take place between Latin America and uh, and Europe uh, because uh, <coughs> Latin America is uh, expected to be a, uh, a a strong region in uh, in the in the medium to long term, um, <coughs> there is not there is a certain expectation also for uh, for the Africa Europe uh, uh, air transport. I, in my in my opinion, that might perhaps be a bit under uh, underrated. Uh, I think this the potential for growth here is uh, is uh, perhaps stronger than this number indicates. Lots of natural resources, uh, lots of, uh, of of clever people, and there is a lot of investments going on now in infrastructure. But there, there are very strong regional differences between uh, between different countries in in Africa. Uh, <coughs> the Africa China trade is not listed on this uh, on this uh, slide, but I I expect that also to to grow quite strongly, because the Chinese are investing a lot in Africa when it comes to infrastructure and they do that <coughs> to be able to to get their hands on uh, on natural resources types of metals and other types of resources and that could be that could spur off at best <coughs> a nice economic growth pattern in Africa and of course also in China at worst, <coughs> we could have a repetition of the rather bad imperialism period a couple of hundred years ago and, uh, and forward, where, where Europe were exploiting Africa's natural resources. So hopefully that, will that mistake will not take place again, but uh, it remains to be seen whether whether there is uh, <coughs> there is a political system that is robust enough to ha to handle uh, that kind of issues. Revenue ton kilometers. <coughs> this RTK is revenue ton kilometers. Um, shows. Um, this is uh, the let's say actual situation. It's uh, some years ago, and this is the forecasts. Forecasts tells <coughs> some of the same story. Where this is, uh, when this bar is higher than that bar, it's uh, it's a kind of forecasted growth. See, domestic China is uh, expected to actually have the strongest growth in terms of volume change even if the volume <coughs> is not very high at the outset. In Asia, decline for Europe, North America, and within North America, but Europe, Asia, and Asia, North America is expected to grow. 
this is a bit different from what we saw on the other slide. So there are different uh, different forecasts that can be made, of course, with you don't, I mean, two forecasts re only re rarely gives the same, the same picture. But at least I agree upon uh, the domestic China, that the growth will be strong there. This <coughs> is important, a kind of important illustration, which can be, which can be transferred also to, also to other markets. It's a systemization of forces and constraints for the development of air freight. In the, as in center here, and the main driving force is world and regional GDP growth, gross domestic product growth. And then <coughs> we have some external factors. I have mentioned industry re relocation already, directional imbalances. It's a kind of a threat. It's, it's very expensive to have uh, a full aircraft going out and then an empty one back. So we need to, to balance the flows. And if you don't manage, it's, uh, it's a problem. Costs a lot of money. Surface competition <coughs> could be a kind of a challenge for, for, for air freight on, on shorter distances. But normally, you, this is not very strong. But it could be on some short short haul routes. Airport curfews <coughs> means that air freight is in many cases dependent upon nighttime operations to be able to, to balance flows uh, and then to meet end customer needs. They need to take off during nighttime. And nighttime departures with heavy freighters is not what you would like to see in areas where, uh, in airport surroundings where people live and so on. It's a lot of noise and, uh, and everything. So many airports, they ban takeoffs at night, during nighttime, which is, a, which is a threat to this. This one, <coughs> and this one could add, well, it, it is linked to this one, environmental regulations. There the CO2 taxes comes into play strikes and things, uh, airport access if there is a problem, currency disparities. I mean, if, if China, for instance, decide to, to devaluate their, uh, their rand, uh, not rand, but RMB, it might be a problem, of course. And then you have the trade quotas and restrictions. So these are sort of the external threats that is, uh, is, uh, <coughs> lies around this market. And then here we have kind of more industry-related rela uh, aspects connected to the markets and to the industry itself. Here we have the typical industry-related issues. <coughs> and then here we comes to it comes to the more the end customer or the market needs express market needs you have deregulation in 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 some markets which may uh, may have an impact on on air transport and uh, with deregulation we can think about access uh, for airlines to enter into other countries' markets. Within passenger transport, we have an issue now between Norway and the US, where this airline Norwegian is struggling for getting access to, <coughs> to parts of the uh, American market, which is still not sold. But uh, similar things applies to the air freight market national development programs, and so on. So it's a way of structuring a description of what is the characteristics of a market, what are the different factors, external and internal factors, that affects this market.
and the growth or decline and so on. Then types of aircraft. <coughs> I'll go quickly through through this. Um, often, as I said, freight is taken on board uh, passenger aircraft um, with so-called belly freight, like this. Just use use the luggage compartment and uh, and uh, load it in dedicated containers. And the containers are often shaped to fit into a specific type of aircraft to be able to utilize the volume efficiently. We'll come back to that when we talk about pricing a bit later on. And then we have <coughs> the dedicated freighters, which, uh, which is uh, often uh, outdated passenger aircraft. That has been the case in uh, in many cases, that has been the way it is. The big uh, Jumbo jets are converted from passenger to air freight uh, purposes, uh, which is, uh, of course, cost efficient because you, you extend the li lifetime of the aircraft. But from, a <coughs> let's say, a fuel efficiency perspective, it's not good because it is uh, often outdated technology and uh, it's not optimal. And again, including or introducing uh, CO2 taxation on jet fuel might also have an impact <coughs> on how these freighters are actually designed and, uh, and operated. <coughs> Charter aircraft services are often made for large shipments between two points. And uh, there are some or quite few companies who offer uh, charter services for air freight. Uh <coughs> one of them is, uh, is the Russian airline Aeroflot, who has some very large carriers that can uh, that are often used when uh, a, cast a disaster or a catastrophe occurs so they are uh, they are flying in um, emergency equipment for instance or they may be used for defense purposes uh, and even then also charters for uh, for fish transports So, uh, <coughs> so it's um, this is a, a rather small but very important market for uh, for international transportation. They are normally big, and they take uh, specialized cargo. You need, I mean, the airline industry in general is dependent on uh, on uh, achieving a high load factor because an aircraft has also this kind of cost shape. And uh, to be able to, to be competitive, you need to have a strong capacity utilization to have a reduced unit cost of transportation. So, uh <coughs> so um, that, is a, that is an issue. And there will be an increasing issue connected to the last point in the years ahead of us. I'm quite convinced about that. Uh, I'm now working with uh, assessing airport capacity in, in the Oslo Fjord area, which is, uh, and the total market in terms of passengers there are around 25 millions at the moment. Quite a, quite a strong market. And um, we are now addressing a scenario where heavy CO2 charges are imposed on air, air transport in general. And what will happen then with, with the demand? In the short run, it will be a, it will be a price elasticity effect uh, directly. Uh, so people will stop traveling, or they, they may uh, use other transport modes or whatever. 
but in the longer run, that uh, heavy CO2 tax will probably affect localization of businesses. And in the longer run, the, the demand effect may, be, may become even stronger. And that affects also the, the air freight uh, business, of course. This is a <coughs> uh, an aircraft used by the defense. Can take off on very short and rough surfaces. Whereas this one is so big and so heavy that during summertime, when it's hot, you need to keep it moving all the time. Otherwise, it will get stuck in the tarmac at the airport. So you need to move it slowly all the time. But if it stands still, it will sink, and uh, you I don't know what you should do about it then. It looks like this. And you see there is a, <coughs> a good number of wheels here to sort of handle that. Right? It, it's extremely big and noisy, very noisy. And uh, as, as and uh, it is used for, uh, it can move tanks and uh, very heavy equipment. And this is uh, another one, which is, a, which is a European aircraft. It's used actually to, to transport components for producing passenger aircraft, Airbus passenger aircraft. It lo doesn't look too nice, I think, but it's designed like this to, to, to transport wings and uh, tails and what have you to produce aircraft. So um, <coughs> the Airbus factory is located in Toulouse in France. And uh, they use this type of, uh, of, uh, of vessels. And in addition, they use inland waterways and road transport to get components for all over Europe, because Airbus is a kind of a political pro project. It started as a, as a joint venture between the UK and France, uh, but uh, it has <coughs> evolved into a multinational uh, thing, where you take parts from all over Europe and merge them together to, to, to an aircraft in, in Toulouse in France. And if you see, <coughs> if you, you can go on the internet and you can have a look at Airbus. And if you see an Airbus aircraft before it is painted, it looks like a mess because it's composed of supplies of from, from all over Europe. And it looks, looks actually like patchwork with different colors. But it looks nice when it's painted then. Containers, <coughs> um, they are not standardized, or they are standardized for each aircraft, each type of aircraft, to, to fill the space uh, made of light materials to, to be efficient, because it's a certain limit of weight, of course, in, a, in an aircraft. So it may have the same shape as, a, as, a, as, a, as an ordinary uh, uh, TEU, 20-foot equivalent unit container, but it's much, much lighter, made of aluminium. We can just consider or have a look at this illustration on the air freight supply chain, which may look different. It may be configured in different ways. Here we see this as stepwise uh, or, or the different steps from the origin to an airport, the airport to airport leg, airport to customer, um, s uh, and um, maybe splitting of cargo, repacking, and so on, and then on to the to the final destination. And you can do this in different ways. There are different, let's say, ways of handling the cargo. Uh, you can use an integrator, and this is not, it's not five integrators, but it's the same company taking care of all the, 
the whole um, chain, transport chain. And then you have a forwarder <coughs> who can do the same. And then re responsibility can be then split between the airport, the, the, sorry, between the airline and the forwarder. Um, on the destination side, you can have a split responsibility between the forwarder and the trucking company. Forward it takes place of the consolidation, splitting, and then on to the to the final destination. And you may have, let's say, a smaller scale operations, local trucker, forwarder, and so on, through this chain and to the final destination. And this is this lower part here is kind of let's say small scale operations. This is the large scale operations where you need uh, one professional 3PL company to take care of the whole chain. And you have an in-between in solution here. And this is, of course, based on uh, the need to exploit scale effects, to handle big volumes, uh, and so on. And here you have the different, different operations. One point that needs to be mentioned is that if you send something, let's say from Oslo to, let's say, Berlin, by air freight, you get a guarantee that this cargo will be in Berlin at the destination, let's say, within 40 hours. But then <coughs> the integrator or forwarder may, may decide to, to use trucks all the way. So a lot of trucking is made on short haul air freight. So if you go into the statistics, and you can see that there is a certain amount of air freight on short hauls, then if you go behind the numbers, you'll find that most of it is done by trucks. The difference is that it is kind of, you have a guarantee for, uh, for connected to the lead time. Then <coughs> rates. The um, freight rates are, are sort of, it's the same mechanism as for, for passenger transport. They are uh, today more or less decided by the market market forces, demand and supply. On low traffic periods, the, the, the rates are lower than in high traffic periods. It's exactly as within passenger transport. But in, uh, in uh, earlier times, the International Air Transport Association actually set the charges based on dialogues with the, with the big airlines. Uh, this is not the case anymore. But it is not long ago since such type of line of conferences within sea transport was uh, common. It was actually banned in October uh, 2010, four years ago. So up to that uh, point in time, the, the deep sea container uh, line lines could negotiate prices in between themselves. And the rationale for that <coughs> had to do with capacity and the consequences of competition in cases wi where you had this, again, cost structure with uh, increasing returns to scale and a very, let's say, thin second-hand market for excess capacity. So to avoid a capacity game where you could, in the short run, see that, say that competition is good, prices down to, uh, to average costs or even below is could be good, but again, fierce competition could drive costs or prices down to marginal costs, and because then the companies would go uh, with a deficit, they could actually go broke in the slightly longer run. So a short run benefit 
could in the long run result in a very limited number of companies. And then you get the monopoly, market power situation, and higher prices again in the longer run. So to regulate this so that everybody could sort of make a living out of this without getting too much market concentration, we had this type of mechanisms, conferences. So that is the sort of the economic rationale be behind that. But uh, at one point in time, one decided just to get rid of it and to deregulate and to more or less ignore this problem. And um, the results can be seen. There are now more or less three big container lines left. In the US, the, big air, the biggest air transport market in the world, it's more or less three independent big carriers left. All the small ones are uh, either bought or uh, they have gone bankrupt. So what will be then the situation in the long run when it comes to prices? One can imagine that uh, they are starting to exploit market power and the prices will go up. And then it's a reason to ask whether such deregulation has caused long run effects that are adverse to the market. You may have hear economists talking about deregulations as a very good thing. I am a bit skeptic. In markets where you have a high, high degree of asset specificity in terms of not having a very good second-hand market for uh, 18,000 TEU container ships. I mean, what should you do with it if, you, if it goes out of business? You cannot sell it. In many cases, you can't. In some cases, perhaps. And, it's <coughs> and also with <coughs> this kind of this kind of vessel, second-hand market, have it in your garden or something? No. So it's it's uh, it's something there which I think is a bit overlooked when we talk about uh, uncritical deregulation. I'm going to a conference this evening on on the ferry market in Norway, the ferries that you see out on the fjord here. In 1996, it was 13 d independent ferry companies. And then they deregulated it, turned it into a competitive market in 2006. And now it is more or less three independent ferry companies left. And the authorities, they are complaining that the prices or the subsidies of running this industry is going up. And I, I, I told them in 1996 that it will go up. Just you wait and see. And now it's happening because of the limited number of players. So it's the same which can take place here. Anyway, <coughs> if we turn back to the, the rate question again, which has to do with what I've just told you, but anyway, um, there are um, weight related rates, um, could be bargains in off-peak periods. You have unit load rates for containers, class rates, contract rates, and so on, depending on the nature of the, of the cargo. And this varies all the time, so it's no point in, in showing you the numbers, actually. Um, but one could also, as a point of departure for uh, setting the, the cargo price is right, one could have a cost approach to this. And then if you, if you consider an air aircraft compartment, it has a certain volume and it can carry a certain amount of weight. And if you know the volume and you know the weight, you can calculate the optimal density of the cargo. And for a given aircraft, this is varying between aircraft, but for a given aircraft, it could be equal to, let's say, 167 kilos per cubic meter. Because then you have filled the compartment, and you have, uh, have also then maximized the, the weight that you can carry. 
So this is the point of departure. And then <coughs> you, you can say that uh, if you have a certain rate that can be derived that you need to have to go break even. When you have a certain volume and you have a certain uh, weight capacity at hand, you need to reach this point. You need a price like this. And then the challenge is to charge cargo, which sort of deviates from this optimal density. So that is the sort of research question here. If you have spacious cargo with low weight, what to do? So, <coughs> and, the, and the calculation of this is, is sort of given here, that um, uh, this, this specific aircraft has a certain volume, and uh, um, one kilo in this case should have a volume of uh, 0 0.06 qu cubic meters um, to be able to fill this, this aircraft. So this is the point of departure. Then we can say that the chargeable weight, because you, you are charging according to the weight of the, of the cargo in this case, has to then to be adjusted with this uh, density factor. So if the density of cargo is lower than the ideal density, you need to increase the price per kilo, the weight price. So you, <coughs> you say that the dimensional weight, which is then um, the kilograms corrected for an increased need for space per kilogram, has then to be calculated as the actual volume of cargo divided by the standard 6,000 cubic centimeter per kilo, as in this case. So the weight that you charge for is able to a dimensional weight which is higher than the actual weight because you need to correct for this, uh, this spatial needs of the, of the cargo. But if density of the cargo is higher than the ideal density, then you just charge according to the actual weight. Because then it will fill the aircraft and, and use the capacity, but you, use, you don't use all the volume. But you cannot use it because of the weight restrictions. So then, th then it's simpler. It's a very simple case here then. Is to <coughs> Let's say this is a box. It weights two and a half kilo and it has a certain measure. So the volume of this is 30,000 cubic centimeter, weights 2.5 kilo, and the density can be calculated by taking 2.5 kilo and divide by the volume, and then you get a density of 83.3 kilos per cubic meter, which is lower than what you would actually like to see here which is a double of this 167. Okay, so here we have a problem. It takes too much space and it weights too little. So what should we do about that? Then <coughs> we actually calculate the dimensional weight as the volume of this box divided by this, uh, this uh, standardized volume which is calculated behalf of the uh, out from the characteristics of the aircraft. And they find that the dimensions weight is not two and a half, but it's five kilos, which is uh, intuitively quite simple because the density of the shipment is half of ideal. So then we need to double the weight. And if we have then a rate per kilo, then we charge this box twice as much as if the density had been on the, let's say, the ideal level. Here it's half of the ideal level, so we have to double the price to, max to, to let's say, get the same revenues as if we just could fill the aircraft up to the weight limit. 
So if weight is the dimensional factor, and we have spatial, uh, spatial cargo that doesn't allow us to use the weight restriction restrictions of the aircraft efficiently, then we have to increase prices for the light weight goods that takes a lot of space. So that is uh, simple logic, actually, to correct for space in this. And in, in real life, then, you, you don't do that because you, you try to, to work with the market. But from theory, you could use that kind of information to do a proper price differentiation between market segments based on the baseline that you have, the, the kilogram costs for, a, for a specific types of cargo. And then you can uh, different prices according to the market's willingness to pay, if you have different market segments. But you see here that you get the um, same mechanism as for passenger transport. You charge according to to the, to the available capacity and the willingness to pay in the market. And uh, <coughs> if you have a situation where the aircraft is uh, filled with passengers and this is an additional revenue, then you can price it quite low because then it's, uh, it's a question of handling and a uh, few, few liters of, uh, of jet fuel to, to get, get the goods moved. So you get in a situation where you compare with, with markets, uh, the market's willingness to pay. So this is it. And it's, uh, it's not much time for going through exams, but I will, mm. I promise when we have this summary lecture, I will not spend very much time on the summary because that is more or less to, to go through the highlights of uh, what we have been through in the course. So let's say that I will spend half the time on that, on that and the rest on exam solutions. And after that lecture, which takes place on the 27th here and 28th in Olsund, I will post solutions to some of the exams, keywords for solutions to some of the exams. So hopefully that will be, uh, be sufficient for you to, to, to prepare. And uh, I will also give some advices. Uh, I will continue giving some advices for, for solving the exam questions. Try to structure the prob problem. Break it down into pieces, which can link up with the literature that you have at hand. And then you just try to use the literature for answering the questions. You don't even need to use your own words. What I, what I look after is uh, what I will consider as positive, is if you are able to use the information to solve the problem. Because that is what you have to do in real life. So when, you are, uh, when, you, when your boss asks you to, to solve something, you go on the internet, you, go in, into the, uh, you dig into the books, into the articles, you, have, you are not allowed to go to the internet in this, during this exam. Then. So that is the difference. But you get my point. Collect information and, co and compile it into something sensible that answers the question. And I don't need very lengthy answers. Short, compact, to the point, it's, it's important. Because if I get 20 pages or more from, uh, from for an exam that lasts for four hours, and I, it might be good, but it might also be too many, too much talk, if you get my point, outside of the topic. So we, it's not necessarily to write a very large number of pages. Bullet points, condensed information, it's okay. And then discussions where I ask for discussions. So a discussion means a discussion. Then you need to try to, to do that and not only present, try to discuss as well. 
All right. Uh, we stop now and, um, and s see you then in two weeks. Because next week there will be a guest lecturer that takes care of the customs and uh, income terms topic. Okay? Thank you.